The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio or its employees or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Geek Skeezers and Googleization Show. I am your host, Ira Wolf, and I'm here with my co-host and with uh, Keith Compagna. Actually, we're together today. Hello, um, he's everybody. In, he's in the Geek Skeezers and Googleization studio. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, our sponsors today are Jobvite and Success Performance Solutions. And today we will be joined by our guest, uh, Jeff Gotthelf. Uh, he's the author of a great new book, Sense and Respond. Uh, we'll be getting to him shortly. Uh, as a reminder, we are recording live today. So if you have any questions, comments, uh, want to speak to Jeff, Keith, or myself, 561-623-9429, 561-623-9429. Um, call us with questions, comments, what, whatever's on your mind. Uh, before Jeff joins us, uh, we usually do a little bit of a recap here, Keith. Sure. Yeah, uh, we've sure. been doing it uh, kind of remotely yep. <laughs> with each yep, other. Yep. Uh, so what's going on with uh, what's big and exciting with you this week uh, that you can share? <laughs> yeah, no, well, uh, <laughs> no, this week it's, it's, it's been a pretty crazy week, but I like crazy. Um, I'm actually doing something real crazy and taking time off. Oh, wow. So I've been trying to, you know, schedule everything. I'm going to Costa Rica with a couple friends, um, but then next week is back to the business, and I'm at an HR Transform out in sunny Las Vegas. Hopefully, it doesn't snow this time. Last yeah. time I was out there, it snowed, and it really, you know, it comes into play. Like the what I'm really seeing and the conversations I'm having out there anymore has everything to do with companies. It, it almost feels like companies are starting to realize they need to start acting on on technology to get to the people. Yeah, well, that'll be interesting today because we're going to talk about that um, with Jeff a lot because, uh, you know, technology um, obviously helps. It automates it. Um, you know, it's it's a lot smarter and faster and more efficient than we are as human beings. The problem is um, when companies don't have a process right. uh, and the right mindset, uh, technology doesn't necessarily fix the problem. Um, that they have so uh, that's uh, so that's a, a perfect yeah. lead in there so yeah big, yeah for and, sure. but you're right i mean i i gave a topic la a talk last week on on people analytics and um you know it, it resonated got a lot of good comments mm -hmm. um you know coming back from that uh but companies are you know still struggling uh mm -hmm. i actually gave uh, i spoke to the local sherm student chapter last night and one of the students happens to be she's probably mid-50s and one of her questions at the end was, does H, she says, one of my professors said that HR is, uh, a degree in HR is a wasted degree. And I was talking to somebody this morning about that. Yeah. And, you know, so we talked about that. And part of it is, the, I, I said, the, based on the stereotype, how HR has traditionally handled um, some challenges yeah. and how they continue to do that, it's, um, that she's probably right. Yeah. Um, is HR really, uh, you know, uh, as I said last week, it came to me, and I, it might have even been from your book, from Jeff's book, um, that that HR doesn't, has been struggling since I ever got in this business 24 years ago. Um, needs this, They want a seat at the table, but they don't, but that's, that time has passed. What they need is a voice at the table, mm -hmm. because many of them have a seat at the table, but, but nobody not, listens they're to not, them. And they're not yeah. saying anything, right? They're, they're. I, uh, not 25 years. Somebody has to be the the geezer in the geeks geezers and Googleization <laughs> show. But um, when I first got into software selling uh, HR software, I thoroughly remember internally we knew 83 percent of our benefit administration clients were not fully utilizing, and that was in like 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you think about how much I really do have a bit of sympathy, I think for for the HR concept because back then they were struggling to keep up, and so they threw technology at it, and then the technology changed, and then while all of that was changing, the entire marketplace changed. 
Yeah. The, oh, absolutely. And, and they don't well, have the that, training. I mean, that's just perfect. I mean, there's, there's so many things you're you're touching on. I, I knew you'd, you you're going to resonate well, and hopefully this is uh, prompting some conversation. So I, I do. I, I I've got so many things. I started out. I said, you know, I'm going to have like one page, and and I went through some of my notes and my highlights, and I, I started to make this list of okay, here's some key points we want to talk on. So three pages later, I said <laughs> uh, I got to stop in the order. So there there are so many things. But uh, just before we get into it, I guess the the two big highlights of my week this week, uh, and I think. You saw it on LinkedIn. Um, one is I got invited to uh, speak to uh, Disrupt HR. I know nice. you've been on, the, that's how we met. Yeah. On Disrupt yeah, yeah. HR. And yeah. I know you've been there a couple of times. Uh, this will be my second gig, but it'll be in Belgrade. Well, it won't be in Belgrade. I am, a, um, I was asked uh, through a connection if I would be the headliner. Really? <laughs> uh, uh, in uh, Disrupt HR Belgrade. Oh, um, so, goodness. yeah. So I'm surprised. I, I, I had posted it up on the LinkedIn the other day. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be there. Oh. Um, uh, but I will be, I'll be recording it and sending yeah. it in. But oh, wow. uh, so that's, that's pretty awesome. cool. And the other thing is I'm now in the Guinness world book of records, uh, really? as of Sunday. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> our, our nephew, uh, Jerry's nephew, um, he's a meteorologist up in Elmira. Okay. And, uh, he, uh, when he went up there, he, I, I, don't, I don't actually know why he picked on this thing, but he was looking for an event, I guess, right. to, to ra- rally the community. And he found the largest, the, the largest human shamrock uh, <laughs> was created in Dublin, uh, and it had like 1,815 yeah, people. Uh, I believe that was the right number, uh, somewhere around that. Right. Um, all gathered in a field in the shape of a shamrock, <laughs> and they got into the Guinness World Book of Records. So he decided he was going to, um, he wanted to beat that. And so he, uh, Sunday, we, we got up really early, drove up. We all got these green ponchos. Um, it's all, actually, if you look up weny.com, uh, uh, or you can find that on Facebook, and, and or just look up the, the world's biggest uh, shamrock. human shamrock you're in it and they had uh, 1200 people in there they actually had 300 people they had to turn away because they didn't have green in order to comply everybody had to be in green right right, uh, right. they didn't have the green uh, ponchos so yeah so now i'm awesome. uh, so uh you know kind of overshadowing every other accomplishment i ever had uh you know de- <laughs> degrees and it. being on tedx and it. disrupt tech <laughs> and said it. yeah i am now in the guinness world book of records as as part of the world's biggest shamrock so <laughs> Hey Jeff, I, I you know I hope Jeff, our guest today, is going to be ready to compete with that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so that's a good segue there. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. You so, got it, Jeff. So, a little background on, on Jeff. Um, Jeff, uh, again, the author of this great new book, uh, Sense and Respond. He helps organizations build better products and executives uh, build the cultures that build better products. Um, he is the co-author of the awarding, award-winning book, Lean UX. Uh, I was just, I, I always, I, I talked about user experience, but I really didn't know how um, sophisticated a process it was um, and uh, how popular it was, but met a good friend of mine uh, in another group, um, and and she took me to a, a different level, so um, I'm, I'm very, very aware of that, and it's a, it's a great process to learn it. Uh, his newest book, as I mentioned earlier, is a Harvard Business Review press book, Sense and Respond. Uh, Jeff works as a coach, consultant, keynote speaker. Um, we will, he, you, you, Jeff, you'll be able to introduce yourself a little bit more. And mm-hmm. uh, he also co-founded Sense and Respond Press. It's a publishing house for practical business books for busy executives. We need to talk about that for, mm-hmm. uh, for another book. Yeah. So, Jeff, welcome to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization Show. Thanks very much, uh, folks, for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah, no, so, and you're calling in from Barcelona, I believe. That's right. So that's, we we are truly an international radio yes, show. Yes, indeed. Now. That's right. <laughs> so that's great. Thanks for uh, helping us uh, reach that pinnacle. Yeah, no problem. I, I, I didn't have a, a world record to share, so if, if I could help with that at least, I think that <laughs> We accept. So, well, it is a world record for us. We're right, international, right? right. right? So, and we know we have one interna- now international we have the, Now we have to change all of our uh, yeah. content. Yeah, that's right. So, so tell us, uh, yeah, there's a couple things. Uh, again, I've got so many questions for you, Jeff. And, uh, you know, our audience is, uh, our target audience is, is primarily people, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, uh, and focused on the future of work, HR. Uh, so even a term like UX um, is everybody says, yeah, we want to have a good user experience. But I don't think that uh, people grasp um, mm-hmm. 
I don't want to say how complicated or complex it is, but uh, you know, you you t- you to me, you took that subject and brought it down to a very um, sort of in-your-face, candid but simple simple approach how companies can handle that. So, what what I mean, what inspired you? I mean, what did, what do you see that um, took this to to sense and respond? Yeah, so, so it's interesting, right? So, so user experience. Um, was was a it's it's obviously as as a as a discipline has been growing for a long time, but with the massive successes of the primarily digital products and services that we all use today, think Netflix, Apple, Nest thermometers, um, Tesla, right? Um, there, the Google Maps, things like that, right? Facebook to some extent as well. Um, there has been um, uh, a, the expectations of of consumers, and 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 by consumers, I mean f- forget the word consumers. The expectations of people have have been molded by these mainstream commercial digital products and services. And so now every organization says, well, I want to be the the Google of real estate. I want to be the Apple of healthcare. And and so there's there's a real desire to recreate the delight it's it's you know it's, it, and delight is appropriate in a lot of situations not in all of them but to recreate that kind of ease of use and that great user customer employee experience that you hear about with, or that you've experienced yourself um, and and people find that it's very very difficult to do and so that's really where the, you know, the, the work that I'd started my career doing focus was how to work initially with clients and then in-house at companies to help them create better experiences for their users, for their customers. And what's fascinating is that over the years, um, even after we wrote Lean UX, Lean UX was an attempt to, to make that process even more practical and tactical and, and, and applicable in today's world. Um, the feedback from these organizations was, well, that's great, Jeff. We think this is; these are all great ideas, but we don't work like this. This is not the. It's not the cult. We don't have a culture that thinks about the customer first necessarily. We don't have a culture that enables our staff to take risks, to learn, um, to make mistakes. And so that really drove myself and my co-author Josh Seiden to really think about: Well, is there another? Is there an opportunity here for another conversation? And a conversation really focused on the managers, the leaders, the executives at these organizations, at these companies, to say, look, if you truly want to create, if you want to be the Apple of real estate, the you know the Netflix of healthcare, um, whatever it is, right? Um, then you've got to rethink about what what the, what the real nature of your business is and how that affects the management of the business itself. And how did that go over? Did they say, oh wait, we know we know how to do that part? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it went, it, went, it went over. I mean, look, it, it's it, it goes over with mixed success, right? Because the main thesis is this: My, the main point in sense and respond is you are in the software business, mm-hmm. and the organizations that I work with and the organizations that have read the book will say things to me like, "Jeff, we're not in the software business. We sell insurance," right. Right? or "Jeff, we are, you know, we are a, a franchised uh, grocery store," right? Like that's that's not. We're not in the software business. We're in the grocery store business. And my, my response back to them, it says, look, the only way that you're going to compete with, in, in the 21st century, the only way that you're going to scale your business, the only way that you're going to deliver on these ex- expectations that people have is to think of yourself as a software-driven business first. And that is a fundamentally uh, different point of view than most organizations have about what it is that they do and how they deliver value to their customers. So taking this to HR and Keith, uh, you know, my, my, my number one groupie uh, has heard me say this and I, I constantly say this and every time I'm still shocked uh, at, at audiences or clients that, that um, I guess don't know this. 
is when we even talk about an application, you know, sort of the beginning of of getting a candidate, you know, that you they do everything. Let's say, assume uh, companies do everything right in getting their message up. They got great branding. Uh, and then the applicant clicks to apply, and it's a horrible process. I mean, it, it, mm-hmm. there is no such thing as in most, most applications any type of user experience except the bad one. Uh, and one of the things that, uh, you know, I ask them is how many people, do they know how many people are interested in applying, but, leave, you know, abandon, uh, you know, abandon it. And what we're seeing in clients that I start to work with is, you know, it, it could be as high as 90%, nine out of 10 people say, hey, I'm interested to apply, but they don't follow through. Um, you know, that's a lot of what you're talking about, I believe. I mean, that that companies spend a lot of money to market, to, to create that impression, to get people to respond, and then they blow it. Uh, I think you had a quote somewhere. I don't remember the exact one. I don't know if it was from you, but, oh, I know what it was. It was about the Nespresso and Tom Peters. Mm -hmm. Uh, And Tom Peters' response to Nespresso after this Twitter battle that they went back and forth was, these folks are insanely awful and suckworthy. (laughs) (laughs) And and that sort of sums up what applicants and candidates feel. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, and and even employees. I mean, even within there is – you know, even the payroll experience, compensation, uh, how do I get a, you know, how do I, I get my time off if they, they have to request some benefits? Uh, it truly is an awful and suckworthy experience. It is. You know, it is. Many times. So, so what's a, what's a first step? I mean, so, you know, you, you, you gave your message, you, you, you talk about companies needing to improve that, their, their user experience. Um, oh, by the way, this is this is just one quote, and and I, I did put this in to my presentations about the candidate experience. That you know, people talk about the competition. They go to industry meetings. They go down. Um, you know, they attend an HR meeting, and the benchmark tends to be a lot of people that are doing the job really badly. And if they're doing as well, or maybe slightly better than bad people, they think they're good. Right. Just, you know, there's a you know, I'm five eight, and my family all runs about five 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 six. So I'm the tallest person <laughs> yeah. you know, in a group of short people. But you know, right. I've got friends that are well over six foot, and and then I don't fear that well. But I, I love I, I picked this stat up. It wasn't obviously something you originated, but it was an Amazon releases new software to the world every eleven point six seconds. Mm-hmm. Just that responsive. I mean, just figuring out what works better. And that's the competition. I mean, that's who your competition. I mean, you talk, yep. and, and again, you mentioned Netflix and um, you know, and Uber and 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 many other really cool companies. Uh, but uh, you know, that's the new competition. And and so I, I use that as a quote: "Is here's your new benchmark." <laughs> and, that's right. And, you know, and, and they buy software. I just had somebody last year, and they said, "Well, we just purchased our our ATS." And I said, "When did you do that?" And they said, "Well, let me think back. Uh, right, 2015." Right, right. You know, they really don't right. know what's, you know, is it is it us, Jeff, or is HR just setting themselves up to get knocked over? Look, look, here's, here's, I, no, not at all. Here's the thing, though. Like, I, first of all, I think that HR is the critical component to the successful evolution of businesses into this kind of digital world that we're I agree. in. I agree. So, and, and and when I work with companies, and I work with companies, primarily medium-sized and large companies, who... Uh, who are going through some kind of transformation when HR is involved in that process. And there are situations where HR is the driver behind those processes as well. But I, what I've seen anecdotally is that the chances of success are significantly higher because they're thinking much more broadly than the application of a new technology, a new system, a new process. They're thinking much more broadly about compensation, hiring profiles, um, onboarding experiences, retention, professional development, all of these things that uh, are so critical to building the kind of staff that knows how to operate in this new world. What else have you learned in that process? Anything come to mind that you weren't expecting? So, look, the thing, the thing that's, that's super important to remember is this. I think you, you kind of hinted at this question earlier, and I think it's a really good one, is where do you start? So we, we use the phrase user experience, and you've heard me use the phrase, uh, the word customer or consumer. Um, the key point here is who are you creating an experience for? Right. So in this in this particular case, like you talked about ATSs and uh, and 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 
application processes for jobs, right? You're creating the candidate experience or the applicant experience, okay? So the most important place to start is to understand the, the applicant or the candidate. In other words, who are you trying to attract? What is, the, what do you, what is that person's goal? And how can you create the, the best possible experience for that person so that A, they can accomplish what they need to accomplish successfully, and B, and, and it's, a, it's, it's only B because we have to talk sequentially, it's probably equally as important as A, <laughs> um, is they get, a, they get the right impression of your organization, right? This is, a, this is an organization that's serious. They understand. They take me seriously. They pay attention to me. And, and the, the, the candidate experience that you're building, I want to be clear, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be wholly driven by technology. Sure, the applicant tracking system will do part of that work um, and, and, there, and perhaps some other, some other digital tools. But every single touch point in the applicant experience, in the candidate experience, is part of what that person goes through and it's an opportunity for you to to optimize and to to create an even better impression for that candidate yes indeed yes indeed i remember uh when i first started getting into software sales i read a lot of peter drucker Mm-hmm. And there's a story about how uh, he he preferred in, in behind closed doors he preferred to be referred to as an insultant, not a consultant, because <laughs> basically what he did was he would sit in front of these incredible boards, at board of directors, and say, "Your job isn't to create a product or a service. Your job is to provide a workforce environment for your employees to thrive in." And mm-hmm. it seems like we've lost complete. Well, it seems like the challenge is to do just that. Back then when he was talking, he didn't have – companies didn't have – they certainly had their advances in technology, but I don't think they had it like they do today. Yep. So a, a couple points to, to touch on that. So first of all, there's a fantastic author and uh, um, writer named Kathy Sierra, and she always talks – she talks about um, don't, don't tell me about the features in your camera. Tell me you're going to make me a, a kick-ass photographer. Right, like that's that that's what I care about. Right, like that make like give me make me understand that this experience will make me the best that I can be at this particular thing. I want to come back for one second though to the eleven point six second stat because that's my favorite statistic in the world, and that is indeed the competition, <laughs> and it's and it's the it's the extreme end of things. But I want to, I want to point out why that's important. The reason why that's important and why that's Amazon's competitive edge is because. Every single time they put new software into the world, every 11.6 seconds, they see that as a learning opportunity. What they're doing is they're leveraging that, the, that the, the system's thinking mindset that says, the faster I get something into a person's hands, the faster I can see how that impacts their behavior. And if it impacts their behavior for the better, I can scale that, I can optimize it, I can roll it out to more more people. But if it impacts their behavior in a negative way, I can roll that back. I can take it offline, I can learn why that didn't work, and then I can come back again very, very quickly and iterate and try to improve that. And it's it's that mindset that that how fast can I learn the next most important thing that differentiates successful organizations from unsuccessful ones. And, and there's no reason why that same exact mindset can't be applied to HR and, the, and the, all the things that HR practitioners do. Yeah, you know, a, a couple things, again, uh, kind of throwing your own quotes back at you, but you, you talk about that we need a new definition of done, mm-hmm. you know, that done doesn't make any sense anymore. <laughs> Right. Yeah. No yeah. one's ever done. Yeah. Nothing's yeah. Ever I done. mean, it's, it's just the continual process. By the way, Jeff, um, as I said, there, there's so many things that you and I just resonated on right away. One, one was your title. And I, I, I don't know why it opened up to this page, but um, the, the, I think the first page when I got your book, uh, it, was chap- it opened up to the, to the, chapter, uh, the chapter one. And your title was Continuous Uncertainty. Everything's changing all the time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that was, I don't, I don't know if you saw that or it came through on any of my messages, but, you know, that was the topic of my TED Talk. Uh, oh. It was Make Change Work for You. It was about VUCA, you know, V-U-C-A. I'm, I'm, uh, are, you, are you familiar with VUCA, the term? Uh, I, 
I am not. Oh, okay, cool. I get to teach Jeff Gottel. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh-huh. yeah, yeah, look it up. Uh, in fact, I'll send you a link when we're off the show to, to that. Uh, VUCA is volatile, is our the world we live in today. It's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Mm, and you use all those terms. I, I, I was sure that's where unknown unknowns came from. Uh, which was another (laughs) phrase that you used. Um, But there's a lot written about that. Uh, It was actually a military term. Uh, The war colleges after the Berlin Wall came down, the whole world was going to change. We weren't going to be fighting sovereign nations. We were going to be fighting terrorism, uh, nondescript enemies. Uh, And they said, we need a new world. We need a new strategy. So they came up with this uh, VUCA. And that's uh, now it's taught in business programs, leadership programs. So Mm -hmm. a lot of people know about it. But uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, that uh, I I've I've written a lot about it, and that's part of that. But that resonated uh, really, really well with that. But the other thing was, and then we're going to take a a quick break here. Um, You mentioned about uh, the watch. Um, In my presentation, I show a IKEA uh, instruction sheet, Mm -hmm. and then I show the finished product. And I say your job description. And this is you know uh, pertaining to job descriptions. I said no one wants to see all the the responsibilities and the essentials and and all the components of the job they want to see what the job looks like what's it going to be like if i right. work for your company they want to see the so um yeah that, that your your message resonates really well awesome. so hey hey we're going to take just a short break here uh you're listening to the geek skeezers and googleization show we're here with jeff Godhelp, uh the new author or the not a new author author of the new book uh, sense and respond. We're talking about uh, UX user experience. We're talking about how fast the world is changing. Uh, we're talking about VUCA. Um, and we're going to take a short break, hear from our sponsors, JobVite and Success Performance Solutions. Stay right where you are. We will be back in two minutes. <music> Behind everything you're searching for is something you're actually looking for. When you search with the real Yellow Pages, you get more than a contractor. You get a whole new curb appeal. It's not just getting directions to a dry cleaner with YP.com. It's rescuing an old favorite from the back of the closet. And it's more than finding a locksmith with YP.com on your mobile. It's getting to sleep in your own bed. Whatever it might be, there are more ways to search and more ways to find exactly what you're looking for with the real Yellow Pages, YP.com, and YP.com on your mobile, only from AT&T. What's up, everyone? This is Keith from the Geek, Skeezers, and Googleization show, powered by Jobvite. Jobvite knows career paths are made by people, not by open job requisitions. Jobvite's platform ties recruitment marketing directly to applicant tracking and onboarding, creating continuous candidate engagement that effectively connects recruiters with qualified passive candidates. Used by over 50,000 recruiters placing over 1 million jobs, Jobvite's platform impacts every company in every industry. Check us out at jobvite.com. Listen carefully. Up to 9 out of 10 job candidates visiting your company career page leave before completing an application. You heard that right. 90% of candidates who want to apply for a job at your company don't. That's just plain crazy, especially in today's tight labor market. Candidate experience matters. Stop turning candidates away. Let Success Performance Solutions help. Call us at 800-803-4303 or register at SuccessPerformanceSolutions.com slash W4CY. Schedule a no-obligation consultation and get special access to insider tips to recruit faster and hire smarter. Welcome back. You're listening to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization Show. I'm your host, Ira Wolf, with my co-host, Keith Compagna. And we've got Jeff Gotthelf here, all the way from Barcelona. Uh, he's the author of Sense and Respond. Uh, during the break, uh, we were just catching up on a couple things. We went uh, crazy fast. Uh, two, two minutes is not a long time, but uh, <laughs> it, this one went really fast. Amazon up- upgraded, what? 20 yeah. times there? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah just 12. Just 12. Uh, yeah. um, right, right, right. So we, we, we got in this conversation of what else, you know, what, what do we want to focus on? And um, Jeff, you brought up a really good point. Um, this requires 
different skill sets. Now, some people may have these skill sets, so it may not be different for them. Um, but if all of a sudden every company is a software company and they're not in HR, insurance, uh, manufacturing, then the qualities that everybody needs um, are going to be different. So, I mean, what are you, you know, what are the skills you look for uh, uh, in, uh, you know, going forward? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not even so much skills, really. It's, it's qualities, right? So one of the most important qualities that I look for is curiosity. Yeah. Um, and and it, to me, it's, it's, there, there's, a couple, there's a couple of traits that I think are critical for success in, in a software-driven business. Um, curiosity is the first one that comes to mind because everything is, everything is it's continuous change is the world that we're in, and that pace of change is only increasing, right? Again, 11.6 seconds, right? So somebody who is never fully satisfied with, with, the, with the current state is absolutely key. There's a phrase I love, speaking of te TED Talks, there's a, the guy who runs uh, Google X, the moon, they call it the moonshot factory. It's where they come up with the you know, internet balloons and, and right, right, self-driving yep. self mm -hmm. cars, right? Right, um, as well. Yeah. Uh, no, no, well, no. So his, na his name is Astro Teller. Oh, yeah. Astro Teller. Yeah, right, right, right. right. Yeah. That yeah. guy, he gives this fantastic TED Talk where he talks. He, there's lots of like really pithy, amazing quotes in it. But um, the one that I love and I, I've, I've borrowed and I use all the time, he talks about enthusiastic skepticism. Um, and, and I love that phrase because I think it, it – totally describes the kind of person that you want to bring into your organization. You want to bring people who are enthusiastically skeptical. Like, this is good, but I bet there's something better. And, and somebody who's always curious to look for that thing. So that, to me, that's the, the, the number one quality. The second quality that I, I look for, and I think it's absolutely critical, is humility. Now, humility, um, people really struggle with humility sometimes. And to me, uh, because they see it as an abdication of leadership. This is a particularly tough one with, with anybody in, in, a, in a senior position or leadership position because um, they, they see it as, well, if I'm humble, then I can't tell people what to do. And the thing that I want to make clear to them is humility simply says, you have a strong opinion about something, but in the face of evidence, and if we're putting ideas into market very quickly, we're going to be collecting that evidence very quickly, right? In the face of evidence, you're willing to change your mind. That's it. That's humility. That's all there is to it. It's, it's the ability to admit, I was wrong, right, in the face of evidence. And to me, the combination of curiosity and humility um, coupled with, obviously, the, 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 you know, some, of the, some of the harder skills that are required for, for developing products and so forth are the key – to building the kind of culture and workforce that thrives in this continuous change and this environment of continuous change. Jeff, where do you see or how do you see employees out there um, finding organizations like this? Because um, I'm optimistically skeptical <laughs> that there are organizations <laughs> that see this trend and have already started working on it. We know the big name companies do, you know, the, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Obviously, they're, they've positioned themselves very well in terms of being employee centric in their experience. But when you go there, come to work, right? How can somebody, um, how can a graduate student or maybe somebody who has three to four years of, yeah, how do they get organizations to, to find them? Or how do organizations find these people or let people know about it? Yeah, so, so the, the, the best thing you can do here is thought leadership. To me, this has been the, the tried and true practice that I've seen both in my organizations and the ones that I've worked with is the organizations that are transparent about what they're doing um, through blogging, speaking, um, podcasting, participating in public conversations, meetups, you name it, those are the organizations that get the best applicants because people are looking for companies to talk about, like you said, show me what it's like to work here. The more transparent you can be through a variety of channels, the more you can paint that 360-degree view of what it's like to work there, and the more you can attract people to that because you're talking about, hey, we work this way, we're looking for these people, we incentivize and reward these people and these practices. And so to me – that's the most successful strategy that, that I've used and that I've seen organizations use to, to create a pipeline of the best candidates.
You know, as you were talking about that, I mean, this is something that I started to approach companies a, a number of years ago. And, and in fact, I just had this conversation this morning. A consultant called me up and said, hey, what do you about it? think about this profile? I really like it. Um, and the one big piece that's missing from it, it's a good tool. It used to be a huge part of my business, um, was that it didn't really focus on how people made decisions. And at the top of the scale of the one that I do recommend now, um, they call it the reflective scale or a need to probe. And essentially, it's curiosity. It measures how curious some, someone is. And it's just amazing because there, well, people come in with 20 years of experience. They've got a great reputation. They've, they've, um, you know, they've, they've had lots of success in the world. And they're maybe in the 20 or 30 percentile of curiosity. And compared to other people, now they obviously have some curiosity, but depending on the industry or what the, the organization is trying to accomplish, um, my concern that I express to the, to the client that is the one that hires me is that how will they keep up? Or will they now rely on their 20 to 25 years of experience, uh, you know, almost the, the mindset of if it ain't broken, don't fix it because I know how to do it. Right. Uh, you know, so that's a big case. The the other thing is, and, and I have this in my book and I mention it all the time, um, is, is and I think this is what you're describing, uh, is having that growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. Are, are you familiar with, are you familiar with um, Carol Dweck? That's W D W E C K. Sounds um, sounds familiar, yeah. Yeah, she she wrote the book and she she talked about education and and this goes to Keith's question. She talked about kids and you know we're taught and I know I fell into this trap. Um, it gets to the point where when you're near the top of your class and the smart kid that you can't take chances anymore. You can't take that course that you may get a C mm -hmm. because now you're not as smart. Now people may think you're not as smart as you should be. And boy, then it killed, you know, especially in the U.S. now with the, the whole debate on kids getting in the school and things, uh, you know, and parents paying their, their way in there is <laughs> is that you're, you know, if you don't have that that highest grade point average, you stop taking chances. And, yep. and that that just seems to be perpetuated. And I think that's exactly what you were just talking about. So th this is, this requires a whole different mindset. <laughs> Jeff. I got a question for you, Jeff. Where are you seeing the companies be more receptive to your message? You've spent a lot of time consulting. Are there specific types of companies that you're noticing, um, maybe industries, where you're getting a, a more proactive response? Yep. So uh, there is a tremendous amount of movement in financial services. There's a realization that um, – the services that are being offered by banks and insurance companies are getting increasingly commoditized. Sure. S switching costs are low. Barriers to entry to new banks and insurance companies are relatively low. And so they've really, they really have to differentiate on creating excellent customer experiences. And in those cases, they have to really think through, okay, like what, what does it mean to be the Netflix of banking? I don't, I, I don't know what that means, right? But, but what, I mean, what, what does it mean to, to create the kind of experience that provides people with a level of service they've never had before and that differentiates you from all of the other banks out there? So I see a lot, a lot of movement um, in financial services. The other place I'm seeing a lot of really interesting conversation is in ed tech and educational technology mm -hmm. um, because the primary target audience is going to be younger people. Obviously, there's continuing education and adult education, executive and all that, but primarily the user base here is younger people and younger people have grown up around these devices, around these tools, these technologies, and they have a set of expectations about how things are supposed to work. And if they don't work that way, they will abandon them. And so there's a lot of push there to understand how to create the best kind of customer experiences and, and build the kind of corporations, uh, organizations that that get close to the, to the, to the student in this case and, and can, can understand how to, how to build tremendous products and services for them. It's interesting that you mention education tech because of the younger, um, let's call it audience. Be mm -hmm. to, and I say that because 
I'm going to be tonight, and I, I've got so many things going on inside my brain, I forgot to mention this at the beginning of the show, but tonight I'm on a panel discussion over at Rutgers University, uh, yeah. talking with uh, the graduates from the, um, the Labor Relations Committee and Alumni Association about the future of work. And I'm, I'm like excited to, sh- to remind everyone there that they have a distinct advantage. The youth today, I think, is coming out of colleges with an advantage that, candidly, as a Gen Xer, I don't know if I had. I think I had my energy level, but I didn't have the, the, the strength of technology, the, uh, the lack of fear of change, um, and all of that stuff. It's almost like I can see how companies are not sure how to handle these new graduates because they're so much more, I, I like to think they're so much more capable of filling these roles that you're describing because they're looking for it. They're used to it. Right, Jeff? So, I mean, look, there, there's an expectation with these. Um, here's an interesting anecdote. So I was on site today at a client and the, the overwhelming majority of the staff at this client, and it's an, it's, to be clear, it's an insurance company, so mm-hmm. back to financial services. Um, they're a global company. Um, the majority of the staff, particularly in the, in the digital product development group, is who I was working with today, um, are millennials or whatever the generation is between X and millennial. Z, Y. Well, know. that's after. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. The, Sorry. Z follows millennials. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the one between X, if there's one between X and millennials. No, there isn't. Yeah. It's there just, isn't. Yeah, not yet. So somewhere. <laughs> 30-year-old, yeah. Thir- You're a writer. The old, oh, they're, they're called older millennials. <laughs> older millennials, <laughs> yeah. And so, the, look, and, and they are literally hacking the systems at work um, or bringing in their own tools to right. do the job in the way that they want to do it. Um, not exaggeration. They're literally using unauthorized technology yeah, what did what did you call it in the book? Um, shadow, shadow IT. Shadow IT. Yeah, I love shadow. that. Right. Yeah, it's it, absolutely shadow IT. Nice. Yeah, and, and like literally, they're bringing in their own devices, their own software, so that they can do a better job, because the organization is failing to provide them with the operational tools they need to do their best work. And and I was just blown away by this. You know, it's just hard to hard to believe. Oh, yeah, you hear it all the time. It's yeah, that's that's pretty common. Hey, Jeff, uh, we we we're gonna have to wrap up in a, a few minutes here. And and again, it's like uh, when when I when I told somebody we're gonna do this hour podcast, and they said, "Wow, like every week," you know, they said that's a lot of work. You know, now it's like, oh, we should have like a three-hour podcast. Oh, no. it's, it's, we we got some great guests, and, and you've been there. Hey, you mentioned about the Netflix of um, you know finance, uh, Netflix of ed tech. Um, have you? And this may be an offline conversation, but have you done anything with um, like payroll? I mean, is there a net? Is there anybody working for a net net Netflix of Netflix uh, compensation? Of <laughs> um, so, look, I, I mean, there's there's services, again, so like Gusto, for example, is the service that I use to run my business, and it it is their best attempt to create a, you know, payroll as a service digital platform. Um, they're very proactive. They take care of everything that I, that I need. They, they send me um, alerts and warnings. Hey, we're about to do this. Hey, you need to do this. Um, and so, yeah, there are like Gusto, for example, is, is the one that I'm familiar with that happens to work particularly well and, um, doesn't require any, any setup on my part. It's completely hosted. You know, it's, 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 it's hosted at the, at their servers and, uh, it works particularly well. So I'm a big, big fan. Yeah, no, excellent. Yeah, and I'm um, actually speaking with the payroll group next week, and uh, you know that's part of the conversation. But I, I, I love the uh, the net. Who's going to be the next the Netflix of payroll? Mm-hmm. Or that's what their their goal should be. Um, hey, we we've got like six seven minutes left here, uh, and, we, and we sure want to be able to give people a way to get in touch with you and and uh, how to get your book. Uh, what are kind of wrapping this up? I mean, you know, Keith and I both work with, with companies HR. They're trying to recruit pep, do both recruit people faster. They're trying to retain people longer. What's the first? I mean, how do people get started on this journey other than reading your book? 
What, what, what would you recommend that they do first? In addition to reading your book. <laughs> In addition to reading my book. Um, look, I think, I think the most important thing is, is, to, is to start thinking about the work that you're doing in, in HR or whatever discipline you're working in as um, move away from this concept of initiatives or projects um, that, that you're deploying or that you're launching into your organization and, and reframe that work as a problem to solve. Ask yourself, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? And then ask yourself the next question, which is, if we solve the problem, what will people be doing differently? Right? So you mentioned at the beginning of the show, you said 90% of people yeah, yeah, say, yeah, yeah, I think I'm going to apply for that thing. And then a lot of people drop out along the way. Right? And so the question then becomes, um, we, we have, the problem that we're trying to solve is that we're seeing 75% drop off in the application process. Okay, great. And if we fix it, what, what will people be doing differently? Well, we want to see, you know, no more than 5% drop off and the quality of applicants go up by whatever percentage or whatever measure we think is important, right? And so really rethinking this from a, from a human-centric perspective rather than a, a project or initiative-centric perspective, right? Instead of saying, we'll implement the ATS, it's we will create the ideal onboarding experience so that we don't lose anybody in the process. Yeah, outstanding. And and that's, uh, yeah, that's, that, that's basically what you talk about with people, predictive analytics too, people analytics, people want to know how to spin the data. And, and the one message is, is you can't go in and say, hey, let's, let's, do some an analysis of all the data we have and see what we find. You have to focus on what outcome, what problem you're trying to solve and what outcome, uh, you know, what are the consequences of that outcome? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, again, you, you've had so many great, um, you know, you, you redefine done and you re and, and success. Uh, I like this quote you had, success is the extent to help our customers achieve an outcome they seek. Um, I've, I've often taken that one step further. It's like, it's not, it's not necessarily the, the cus the my customer, but helping. How could my service help my customer's customer? Right, <laughs> do something yeah, better. Absolutely, uh, it's almost two tiers down. Hey, so Jeff, we we got uh, uh, you know four minutes left. Um, how can people get a hold of you? What's what's other than going to Amazon and buying your book? In addition yeah. to, <laughs> yeah. so the the, the the there's there's. There's really four four really easy ways. So when I'm on LinkedIn, feel free to connect on LinkedIn. I'm really easy to find there. Um, I write monthly um, on Medium, so Medium.com, and there's always I've got a I've got a long-standing blog there. I, I think that just came out. Did, did one just get released this morning? Newsletter went out today, and yeah, I always okay. I always post it on um, on Medium by the end of the week. So it'll be up on Medium by the end of the week. Um, I am uh, my website, which is. Uh, gothealth.co, so my last name, G-O-T-H-E-L-F.co, um, will uh, always will help you find me. And then lastly, I'm on Twitter. My Twitter handle is jboogie, and we simply don't have enough time left in the show for me to explain that one. But uh, <laughs> just, hey, hey that, that's, that's good. Because, Sounds uh, like we're going to have it back on the show. A week ago or two weeks ago, we had uh, Reed Schaffner <laughs> from Cornerstone, and, and his uh, Twitter is uh, re re redacted. Okay. Redacted. <laughs> nice. So, yeah, very, very cool. So, hey, uh, final words of wisdom. What, what would you uh, like to share? Uh, I would say this. I would say, look, th think of every opportunity to, uh, it, when you're doing your work, as an opportunity to improve somebody else's experience. And if you think about it that way, I think we're always making steps towards improving the things that we do. Absolutely. Jeff, pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for uh, introducing us to the international podcast universe. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. This was a blast. Yeah, no, absolutely. We'll be, we'll be in touch. Hopefully you'll come back sometime. Uh, you'll you'll be quoted quite a bit and uh, watch, watch for my blogs. I'll let you know when they're out. And, and uh, the podcast should be up in a few days. So we'll, hopefully we'll get that shared with a lot of people. So. Awesome. Thank you very so, much. Yeah, very good. Yeah, it, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Um, hey, we've, we've had our guest, uh, Jeff Gotthelp, from uh, the author of Sense and Respond. And uh, next week, we're going to be talking to a good friend and colleague of mine, Ed Crow. 
Uh, he's been in HR. Um, it started with UPS, but been mm-hmm. in HR for the last uh, 20 years or so. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're going to be talking about the future of HR. Yep. Um, he he from somebody internally, he's trying to change it. Nice <laughs> internally, he's got a great business. He's uh, so he'll be our guest in April. We got a great lineup coming up. We'll, we got some surprise guests that we'll 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 announce we'll announce soon. Nice. So, um, anything. On no, your agenda just, uh, this week? T- for those of you keeping up with my LinkedIn profile, look at uh, tomorrow or the next, well, next week, actually. I'll uh, re- be reposting the what we learned from the Rutgers tonight. Okay, and, super. And uh, that's yeah. about it for me. Yeah, and uh, yeah, not next week, the following week. I'm going to be at Sherm New York. Uh, just got that presentation off put and uh, Sherm Talent. So any listeners that uh, are going to be in New York City or Nashville, uh, come up and uh, we'll chat, introduce yourself, and, and that'll be fun. Uh, I have to make arrangements with you because I think I'm in the air. To, <laughs> I think I'm on stage <laughs> uh, in, in the April for, for one of those. No so, problem. So, excellent. Uh, so, until next week, uh, you are listening to the, not until next week, but you are listening, you have been listening to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization show. Uh, we're bringing you topics and thought leaders discussing a future of work where the tired, the wired, and technology converge. Uh, we'll be back next week, Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time on W4CY.com. And then you can listen to our rebroadcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and about 20 other platforms. This is your host, Ira Wolf, and I'm here today with my co-host, Keith Compagna. Don't let the shift hit your plans. Mm-hmm.